wasn't quite that way. That's that's probably the first lie. But uh, <coughs> anyway, pretty well talked about what hopefully would be interesting to you. Uh, flying and airplanes are my favorite. One of my favorite subjects, I guess I'd say, and especially the the Mustang. <coughs> it's beautiful. And I like to be around uh, planes and plane crazy people. So I hope uh, hope I can pass on some some things of interest for you. Uh, the older I get, the more forgetful I get. So I'm probably going to have to get, keep to my notes a little to keep on track, or I might wander off. And uh, if you any questions come to mind uh, as I go through, well, maybe we can get to them at, at the end. And uh, things you might occur that you'd have questions on, I'll give her my best shot to answer. <coughs> uh, to get into this, uh, I know you want to hear about the the Mustang and the mission and its use in Korea. But I'd like to give you a little background on the Mustang history <coughs> and, and some on the, on the training that we had, you know, that prepared us to, to, uh, to get into the, these birds. And maybe a little how I happened to arrive in Korea with the Mustang. It's a, the story kind of ties in. But uh, Pearl Harbor came. I was a senior in high school. and. Uh, December 42, a year later, it was an opportunity for me to, I consider an opportunity because I wanted to fly to, to join the Army Air Corps in the Aviation Cadet Program. And uh, so I enlisted in December and, uh, and uh, I was called, uh, got my greetings, you might say, to the Air Corps in uh, February 43. And I they took basic training at Lincoln and Army Air Base in the winter time, and uh, I got to say that was for an 18-year-old kid the first way day or first time away from home is kind of a rude awakening. I see some of you in here that probably can relate to that basic training. I don't know if, it, if there was a worse uh, basic training phase, but. Anyway, it was pretty rude awakening. After that, uh, I was fortunate to get three year, uh, three months of, of college training at Nebraska State Teachers College at Wayne, Nebraska, where they, they gave us uh, boning up on physics and math and navigation and stuff that would help us uh, in the flying program. We then went to uh, <coughs> Santa Ana, California, the Army Air Base there, for classification and pre-flight. That's where they test you, <coughs> lots of crazy stuff, and then they classify either pilot, navigator, or bombardier uh, for training. I was pretty happy to be qualified for pilot training, and uh, but I would have been real happy to qualify for any of them because I want to fly real bad. Uh, <clears throat> the three uh, phases, main phase of pilot training that we went through, and I hope this is kind of interesting to you, uh, we went to Santa Maria, California, was primary training, primary flight, and a PT-17 Stearman. We have one out in that hangar here, but it's, it's the blue and yellow, the dealie with yellow wings and open cockpit. That's what we learned to fly. And what was thrilling about it, had an open cockpit, and it flew with the helmet, the goggles, wind blowing, and all this jazz. So it was quite an exhilarating experience. That was the first airplane that I soloed, and, and that was a big day for me. One of the big ones. <coughs> uh, after that, we went to basic training in, one, in the BT-13, which we call the Balti Vibrator, and that's where we learned to 
started a learning instrument flying under the hood, night flying, and formation flying. And we also have a BT-13 out in the hangar, and it's the other blue and yellow, blue airplane with yellow wings. It's a low wing airplane. That was the, the next phase. Then we graduated from <coughs> advanced flight training at Luke Field, Arizona, in AT-60. That was in June of 44. And uh, that was where we received our wings and our commissions. And uh, that was another great day in our life. And uh, here <coughs> we were, most of us, I was 20 years old. And I was uh, pretty hot stuff. I was, about, I was ready to, to get ready to tackle a Luftwaffe in the Japanese there. <coughs> That's the way we felt. We were pretty, pretty cocky at that time. Uh, from there, we had our first gunnery, air to air and air to ground gunnery. And would you believe this? Was in an AT-6, advanced trainer for the 30 caliber machine gun in the nose, uh, just above the cowl. And uh, that was a Gila Band, Arizona, and it was hotter than hell down there. <laughs> Uh, we were sweating and roasting all the time with 115 in the shade. Uh, but it was an interesting experience. From, uh, from there we went to Victorville, California and flew P-39 transition. The P-39 is the air cobra. First one of you aren't familiar with that. And we figured it was pretty hot stuff too. But it had the engine behind the pilot drive shaft up between your legs to a <coughs> rotary gear shaft in the nose. <coughs> oh, my nose are all over again. <laughs> now I'm a son. I've got to get Nate to give those back to me. <coughs> Thank you, Nate. <laughs> Anyhow, when you start that P-39 up, <coughs> there was a some lash with the U-joints or whatever, stuff up between and then rattle around, you shake until it started running smooth. Then it was a pretty good airplane. Anyway, the next big moment uh, from there, I went, uh, got my first leave and I went home and got, we got married. Mother and I, have, uh, I've been engaged. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're glad. I'm glad you're glad. And that was another big moment in my life. So, Even though I was a little bit crushed, because uh, my mother and dad had to sign for me because I wasn't old enough to get married. <laughs> my wife was old enough, though. <laughs> Your son had the same I hesitate to say that. The girls didn't have to be. They, you know, uh, as old as the guys, I guess, married. Legal. Legal. <laughs> Why do they get uh, to make it legal? Well, let's see, i got to get right on the right page. <coughs> from, from there, uh, we're out, oh, in only 10 minutes? I guess I can, I can slow down here a little. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you some of this. <laughs> anyway, uh, we uh, ferried, we were stationed uh, different places ferrying airplanes. Uh, they didn't have anything else to do with us. Uh, uh, they had, well, a training school for uh, for the transition and operation. So we ferried airplanes all over the country. Uh, the planes we'd flown and the P-39 and ferried them and, uh, to Montana for the Russians to take over to Russia and this kind of stuff. But uh, uh, <coughs> then we got, went to Luke Field, where we had P-40 branches. P-40 Warhawk was a bird. If some of you aren't familiar, you might have seen pictures. that has got shark teeth and fierce-looking eyes. It's a, it's a, it's a, they call it the Warhawk, and the, the uh, Chinese, uh, what were they? Flying Tigers, yeah. They flew them in China, and then they were good trading airplanes for us. And uh, then uh, after 
after this, uh, we went back to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska in a fighter pilot pool, they call it. They had air crew pools waiting for shipment to go over to Europe. And uh, we were there uh, when the when the war ended in May 1945, so we went back to Luke Field, and I were on orders to operational training in Florida, that's where Al was, to uh, take operational training in a P-51, and uh, then BJ Day came, so June, or August 45, so I, I was out of the service, or we were out of the service, I better say we. In uh, September 45, and uh, I never got to fly a Mustang. Uh, so I, uh, even though I was pretty anxious. Oh, back on that, I, I meant to say when we were flying P-40s at Cook Field, transitional, there were Chinese pilots there that were flying uh, uh, Mustangs. Uh, taking transition and operational training. So, I don't know, some of these pilots might have been <coughs> Chinese pilots uh, on the other side in Korea. I often thought of that. We probably trained them at Luke Field. They weren't too good, though, because they cracked up a lot of airplanes, and that's what got to make me go better. <laughs> <laughs> Here, they, you know, they were getting lost, and, you know, Mustang out on the desert, and they had, had us looking for them when we were out there and this kind of stuff. Anyway, generally they did all right, but they, in those stages, I don't think they had the background that we did to, to fly airplanes, but uh, I'm sure they came out all right. They, but anyway, so that's another story. Uh, I joined the Utah Air National Guard in... Uh, October 1950, and uh, hey Larry, would you stand up? You're, you're a charter member member of the guard. Uh, Larry is a fellow pilot, and uh, he was the uh, original pilot in the Air Guard flying Mustang. That's a long time ago. A long time. Yeah. I was in the guard in uh, 1949, and of course when the Korean War broke out. You were in fighter bombers. Yeah, fighter bombers. I'm, I'm, I'm a fighter bomber pilot. Yeah. And by that, by that, what is meant is that um, I flew P-51s, uh, strafing and rockets and, and bombs, supporting the troops on the line and not flying in the air defend, uh, defending the uh, bombers. Okay. The Air Defense Command took care of protecting the bombers. We were in the tactical air command, which took care of supporting the troops up there. And I really loved them. Yeah. We loved you, too. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, uh, I was pretty
dive bomber out of it. They put speed brakes on it so they could, could dive more steeply without building too much airspeed, and it uh, made a pretty good dive bomber in support of the troops. Uh, as uh, as it, things went on, the urgent need came for a, a high altitude, long range fighter. And so the, the Mustang was good with the Alice enough to, to a certain altitude, but the thought they weren't so good. So they converted them to uh, Rolls Royce uh, Merlin engines. 1450 horsepower with superchargers, two stage superchargers, so they could operate up to 40,000 feet. And uh, great, they had, they had an airplane <coughs> that could escort, uh, it was highly maneuverable, and uh, had good speed and uh, good endurance. Uh, I mean, eight and a half hours endurance with tanks and uh, uh, speed around 4, 435 or something like that, 437, which was about 35 miles an hour faster than the Pope Wolf. And then the Endurance, eight and a half hours and 2,000 mile range compared with the Spitfire, another great airplane, but it was one and a half hour range for Endurance. It had that. a three bladed prop before they got the four bladed prop, if you remember. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the late. That's the later version. Uh, yeah, that's the later version of the third. The A's and B's, I think, were three bladed, and then they did come out with these big battle props. So, uh, anyway, this gave it a capability of escorting bombers into the bombers into Germany, uh, anywhere in Germany, and. Uh, Helping protect against the uh, German fighters, and uh, I think the bombing crews even they might be afraid they were good old friends. <laughs> That's what we told them when they came down. Yes. Protect. Uh, hopefully, they, they, at least they ca helped cut down the losses in bombers. And uh, one thing that was uh, stated by Hermann Göring, the, the chief of the Luftwaffe, when he was asked. Uh, when he realized that Germany was, was losing, would lose the war, <coughs> he replied that when bombers came to Berlin with escort. So, anyway, that tells a little bit. Uh, uh, the bomber I mean, probably still won the war, but the loss of it was been greater. The, the loss was terrible anyway, as you, some of you may remember the colonels talking about the P-17 mission last week. Uh, okay, between the end of the war two and the Korean war, <coughs> the 51 Mustang became outclassed by jet fighters. I mean speed and altitude and maybe not so much maneuverability uh, but striking. Anyway, so <coughs> the 51s were most of them committed to Air Guard Squadron, and uh, the Air Force got RF-80s RF and F-84s, and later the F-86 Sabre Jets came into the service. <coughs> Many of the airplanes were sold at a fraction of their value. It was almost disgusting what they sold for. Uh, foreign nations picked them up, uh, Sweden, Australia, Great Britain, Israel and the Netherlands, South America, and other countries used Mustangs in their air forces up until 1960 or later, some of them, in the South American countries. <coughs> but, uh, well, during that time, it was designated instead of P-51. In 1948, it was designated F-51. And that's when the Air Force, the Army Air Corps, became the United States Air Force. That's why sometimes you hear us say P-51 or F-51. That's, that's what happened. Uh, because uh, <coughs> of the limited, oh, when the Korean War broke out in June 1950, uh, there were only a few Mustangs that the Air Force had in service. So uh, it 
because uh, you know the, the guard had them and, and <coughs> a lot of them have been put in storage and all. But they found <coughs> a dire need for a long-range airplane that could operate for an extended period in the target area uh, and uh, uh, fly off some of the limited facilities in Korea. Uh, some of the fields to begin with weren't very good. Gradually they in, improved them to near acceptable. Mr. Larry would testify on this. We were fortunate to, uh, we had a good field. Anyway, that's a little history there. The F-51 offered a magnificent airplane to operate in its ground support, uh, uh, rocket firing, and straight uh, uh, bombing and napalm dropping and, and all this was was an ideal airplane. So they came in and <coughs> this was, as Larry mentioned, in support of ground, ground troops uh, and uh, up on the what we call the, the bomb line. Uh, the Air Force obtained several hundred from mothballs. <coughs> Some of the, some of us pilots, I think they pulled out of mothballs too <laughs> to fly them. And uh, like Larry was in in '49, I got in the guard in, <clears throat> in uh, October 1950. And uh, March 1951, we were activated, and uh, I was in Korea in August '51. So uh, they. I might say that about over 90% of our pilots were in our squadron were uh, reserve and air guard pilots that were recalled. That's why I did not fall. Uh, <coughs> I uh, was assigned uh, uh, to uh, the 45th Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron in Taegu, Korea. And uh, that's Taegu down on the south end of Korea. I don't even have it on that map, but uh, where they about kicked us off uh, during the Korean uh, where, where the Chinese and Korean forces uh, uh, about pushed us off of Korea. And uh, uh, well, anyway, out of Taegu at one time they were flying missions and. Very short time after the wheels were in the well, they were working on the North Korean troops. Anyway, by the time I got there, the, <coughs> the bomb line was stabilized. Oh, tell you about a little more before I get into that. <coughs> when I arrived there, I uh, I looked out on the, the flight line, and there was dusty, dirty-looking airplanes, and it was hot and sweaty, and I wondered. Thought to myself, what am I doing here, you know? But uh, uh, the airplanes were very well uh, maintained. Uh, these ground crewmen, they, they worked their hearts out trying to keep those things summer and winter, keep them tuned up. And I don't think anyone would have done better in the States. <coughs> I have some pictures that you're welcome to look at. They're hard to see, I know, from back there. Uh, one of them is, uh, shows the maintenance out on the line. Uh, the crew chief's working on the airplane. Here's my crew chief. Uh, and by, by an airplane that was assigned to me later in my missions. But anyway, those guys <coughs> want to say where's their hearts at. Uh, another thing I remember arriving there is I went to take a drink out of a canvas water bag. It was treated with, it was hot and treated with quinine, I think, and, you know, for malaria and whatever. But that was the worst taste in water I ever, ever had. We drank other things over there, you know. Drank a lot of coffee, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I actually, uh, oh, I wrote down here. Uh, I kind of came to the sudden realization at that time, not that I hadn't known it before, that those suckers were, were weapons, you know, they weren't playthings out there. And it was it was a kind of a solemn uh, feeling, you know, to really have it banged home to me at that point. You know, what am I doing here? I'm going to fly that sucker, that's a weapon. But then I found out <coughs> later, 
too, that as Larry and some others find out, it, it, this has been called a police action over there. And we used to kid about that because we knew damn well it was a war. Unless so, anyone figure otherwise, you know, it was a, it was a war over there. <coughs> this uh, assignment I had was a very interesting mission, very challenging. We were part of a combat intelligence group, and uh, our job was to primarily was to search and destroy. I got a this is our squadron patch, and it, it shows uh, Korea uh, with the 38th parallel with the Mustang and a pilot with his field or spy glasses and a, a machine gun out on the nose. Anyway, that was primarily what we were there for, <coughs> was to find <coughs> targets uh, and gather information, intelligence information, so that our troops could use it. <coughs> and we did this by visual uh, snooping in the north of the bomb line and taking photographs uh, of the various uh, areas, uh, some assigned and some spontaneous, you know, we saw something we I think it was worth it. taking pictures, we took them. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you about the picture taking here. But, uh, actually, i got to tell a, <clears throat> a little story. My first uh, uh, recce mission, when I was debriefing with the intelligence officer, we always had a debriefing to tell them all this neat stuff we'd seen. And I reported some, uh, this was a mystery to me. There were big mounds of dirt, and they were, oh, eight, maybe ten feet across. I guess uh, they looked in the air to be maybe four or five feet high. <coughs> so I, I told them, I said, what, what are they hiding down there, you know? What are they, they're random around villages, and they're all over hell up there, you know? And uh, he'd see Granny and he said, well, those are Korean graves. That's the way they buried the dead over there. They're Pretty well, uh, the graves are they're in humps of dirt. So, anyway, I think they that was a test of the first <coughs> recognition to see if you report that. I guess we were supposed to report anything suspicious or we didn't understand or things we couldn't understand or whatever. But that's another story. <laughs> uh, when I simply worked uh, north of the bomb line, uh, I, this is Korea and the Sea of Japan and the China Sea and our base at Kimpo and there was a, what we call a bomb line, was a line established. S south of the bomb line was our troops and north of the bomb line was their troops. And uh, the area was divided into core areas. Uh, where the various infantry divisions were stationed along that line. And uh, there was uh, I Corps, and IX Corps, and X Corps, and the First Rock Corps, which was the uh, uh, Republic of Korea. Uh, they were on the east, eastern area. And uh, so <coughs> this was, uh, this was the, the area that we wrecked was up in the, what they call the target area or up there north the bomb line. Uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to describe this terrain. This green area to the west was fairly flat in our agricultural area, but the eastern area was mountainous, much like the Wasatch Range. And uh, pretty damn rough, rugged country up there in the summer or winter. And our troops had to live up there, you know, camp out and live in caves and revetments. In the wintertime, it was quite uh, an experience to fly over that bomb line. We'd been in our warm sacks and see those infantry guys up coming up. We'd been up through the snow on the trail and huddled over a fire, you know. <coughs> we didn't catch many of the North Koreans that way, but our troops. Uh, lived in some pretty lousy situations over there, our infantry, and the Marines, and the 
Iraq troops, the Koreans and the other supporting nations. Uh, <clears throat> oh, we had, uh, you say we use these photos for not only intelligence information for the troops, but we use them, they would evaluate them, and uh, intelligence would uh, will make these uh, intelligence assessment reports, which are, these are kind of dog-eared a lot of this stuff, this submission report where the photos were taken. And then they would mark what was at these targets, uh, whether they be supply areas, artillery positions, or uh, vehicle revetments, or whatever. And we would use these, these uh, photos and, uh, oh, we had large-scale maps. Uh, got one here somewhere. Oh, well. Anyway, we had large-scale maps, and in combination of that, we would go to these targets, and we would rendezvous with our fighter bombers. This was a, a map that we carried for recce work. Showed where the bomb line was. This is was First Rock Corps and a good part of, of Ten Corps, which is where I flew most of my missions. Uh, uh, excuse me, a lot of share. And uh, we uh, <coughs> we would oh before I get to our rendezvous and what we how we worked with the, the bombers. Uh, talked about the train and the, oh, the uh, how we zeki a bit. Oh, we we strafed a lot of targets of opportunity too, because we would catch trucks or supplies or whatever. We could work them over. Well, anyway, tell you about uh, our bird <coughs> here a little was. Was especially mo oh, this model, by the way, was built by Alvin and Alain's son for me. And it's a replica of my assigned airplane in Korea, and even modified with the oblique camera, 10 inch camera on the side, where we could take pictures of the side, and the vertical camera where we took pictures vertically, this type over here. We took those pictures with a about a 60 or 80 degree over, percent overlap, as I recall. So they just put stereo on them and get two images and get third dimension. And you go over to intelligence and look at those targets in third dimension, and you know, all kinds of stuff that pop out at you, you know. Trees were an exaggerated thing. But anyway, that's what we use the cameras for. <coughs> I might have to mention there's a name on no, my nose art on here, the airplane that I was assigned. I named my harem. <coughs> and uh, I was accused of, you know, being a Mormon polygamist. <laughs> Actually, uh, the name was for my wife and for Kathy and for Jen. So, so anybody that puts a record straight on that. Uh, I guess that's about all I can tell you about the, the Mustang. Uh, we flew, oh, uh, let me say that we, we rendezvoused with fighter bombers over various locations, uh, known locations, all of us, the punch bowl or the watch on radio boy or whatever. We would actually take this information to go out and make sure the target was still there. Then we rendezvous with the fighter bombers. Then we'd go to the target. It would be a flight of four. <coughs> and uh, then we would go in <coughs> with their, their leader. We, he would fly loose wing. And, uh, sometimes we, we could see the target. We, we knew where it was and how it was covered and all that. So they would go in on our wing and we would strafe and they would drop a <coughs> fire rocket or drop an A-bomb or something to get his fire going to relate, to, you know, to the rest of the things in the target area. And then we would uh, quick fly up where it was a little safer <coughs> while they go down and do the dirty work. And uh, to help direct them, you know, to things, you know, they might not have seen. But once they got started on the target, they could see all kinds of good stuff that blow up. But, uh, uh, we would 
take post strike uh, pictures after after they left. Uh, we would take uh, pictures of the target. There's two down here that you can't see very well with smoke and stuff and the, the assessment on them. Whether what uh, what was direct hits, what was uh, how they were assessed for damage, whether we'd have to go back and do it again. But, uh, who was most vulnerable to the anti-aircraft fire? You or your bombers? Or? Uh, we were we're all vulnerable. Anytime you got below four or five thousand feet, you were more vulnerable to something. The closer you got to the, <coughs> the deck on a target, they were very well defended. Uh, we got a, like I say, I felt a little safer up after we got that first mark on the target. And the, but the bomber, the fighter bombers, they they had to go in regardless. Uh, you know, that's what they were there for, to destroy that target. Some of them were, it was a hostile area, you know, and uh, some of those targets were damn well <coughs> defended. Uh, they had quad 50s, quad 20s, uh, flak stuff, and, and all kinds of stuff around them. And they didn't think too kindly of us coming to <coughs> get rid of it, you know. So, <laughs> uh, we were happy. Sometimes, uh, you know, you didn't know where they were going to shoot from. You, we knew where the gun position were. Usually told the fighter bomber jocks where, you know, they could expect fire. If, if we knew, if they were gonna, we could guess they might get it if we knew where the some position was. <coughs> A lot of times they would destroy them, the gun position, before. So they have a lot safer going in on the target if you could get those guys or get their heads down or something. But uh, anyway, or keep uh, get their attention or <coughs> scare them or whatever. <coughs> but uh, it, uh, the fighter bombers were, it was a damn hazardous job uh, going in on, the, on ground attack. They did a beautiful job, uh, very impressive to me. See uh, what the rockets and bombs and napalm. It was mean. I don't really any of you know much about napalm, but I think that some of you do with that. It's it's real real mean weapon, <coughs> but you have to drop it properly. It's a jelly uh, petroleum deal that explodes and it intense fire and even takes the oxygen out of the air areas it hits where there's troops or, and the extreme temperature burning the tanks that well they didn't run the tank if you drop any near them and uh, so it was a pretty pretty vicious weapon right Larry sure. some guys that weren't experienced uh, if you drop them too steep they just kind of flop and fly a fire but you drop them right, which was kind of a puckering type mission. You come in low and on the target and drop it ahead of it and scatter the fire for several hundred yards. And then you just have one big hot fire. And you just want to be near it if you're on the ground. <coughs> uh, we had 18 supporting missions in that war. And... Uh, we even had the Navy and the Marines were our allies. <laughs> you see any of those guys with the Enterprise or something on their head? Uh, they did a good job. I, I thought that it was might be well. The, the Navy, uh, Navy and Marines were flying Corsairs and ADs, what we call ADs. I don't know whether many of you know what an AD is. It's, a, it's an airplane that was built for the ground up design board for, for ground support, using a lot of other things, but it was a good dive bomber. And it, I've been told, <coughs> I tried to, I forgot about researching this, that it would carry as much armament and payload as a B-17. But I don't know how close that is. I, I don't remember what it is. What did B-17 carry? 2,000? The average one was 10 500s. And any variation. Oh, 10 500s. Yeah, 48 100s, 5 2000s, variations, roughly 10 
If I can, well, I'll have to research it. So I don't want to tell you a lie, but I know they did carry a, you know, a lot of armament because we had the one we would rather do with them. We'd have to write it down. It took you a half hour, it seemed like, to write down what the fighter bombers were carrying, whether it be Mustangs or especially the CD. You thought they had five B B-17s with them or something. But reading off the rockets and the napalm and the cannon fire and all the stuff they had. Anyway, they did have a... I'm a bit of an icon. They were very effective. I don't know what language they were driving or so many others, but they, they had a, what they call a BT bomb, a BT fuse bomb, that they could dive bomb with this thing on gun positions. And uh, it would explode in the air and just spread out like a big shotgun. And uh, we wouldn't hear much from those guns after, you know, after they dropped the VT bomb. But uh, <coughs> that was uh, the AD, and this was a beautiful Corsair. <coughs> See the Marines and, and uh, Navy flew those. This was a good, pretty good dive bomber, too. It was slower, but it had a lot of lift and was very maneuverable. That was a good airplane. <coughs> Let's uh, see. Uh, oh, <coughs> tell you a duck story. I uh, often thought after getting back, we were talking about the uh, hostile environment. Uh, I like to hunt ducks, but I I know how a duck feels when it comes in and deeks in a, a bunch of decoys and gets shot at. At least I know how the one feels that, that got away. Uh, I don't know if I was ever had that feeling, but uh, a duck pretty, gets pretty excited when you take that first shot and goes up in the air. But, uh, uh, oh, something that might interest you, the way we flew, uh, we, in our squadron, we went out in pairs. There was a leader and a wingman. And when we were over the when we went over the bomb line or into the target area, we started the basic action. The, uh, the, the flight here, the wingman usually flew maybe 200 feet above somewhere in that neighborhood and, and behind all oh, at least three or 400 feet so that he could observe the ground fire, fire and flak when a, the lead was rushing or taking photographs or, or whatever. And when we cross the bomb line, <coughs> we'd start this evasive action, which uh, was up and, you know, up and down, changing altitude and attitude at all times, altitude and attitude, so that they couldn't track us as well on some of their, from some of their flak positions. And it, uh, it was pretty well duck soup for the guy wrecking, but sometimes the guy flying formation and trying to stay up in position and watch it. When you were turning, he usually had to reverse turn, and turn the other way, reverse, and all this kind of stuff. It uh, worked up a sweat for a wingman, you know, flying, flying uh, a, a, a wrecky mission. Sometimes uh, you lost the wingman, or you lost sight of you. Uh, See, I lost you, <coughs> I'm up over so-and-so, wrecking, and so you get back together. You didn't like to be without a wingman. <coughs> uh, we, uh, uh, something interesting, uh, I think, uh, I had the fortune of uh, flying a couple of naval gunfire directing naval gunfire missions. <coughs> he gave a few of his training on uh, uh, directing or <coughs> artillery fire and uh, all the fire for line, uh, you know, two shots, one long, one short to get alignment on the target so we could call them and get them bracket them in until they fired for effect. Firing for effect is after they get with maybe a, a round within a uh, 300 yards or so of that target. They know where the target is by then, so the fire effect is they fire all their big guns into that high exploding shells. And <coughs> I don't know how a bunch of bombs could, uh, could do any more harm, but uh, sometimes I wondered about
out your target. <coughs> you know, they, they had intelligence information on their targets. We'd call them and go find a target for them. And, uh, one day, they <coughs> it was a big old concrete building sitting right out like a sore thumb on the east coast. I figured uh, one thing thing there. Nobody had anything in that big block building, but they hit it, and it blew up about oh a good thousand feet in the air. It was an ammo dump, so it, it was very impressive. I can see that very vividly. You know, we were sitting. It was kind of a surprise, you know, a big fireworks. <coughs> During one of these missions, I'm getting down to the finale. I think I much fun. I'll talk fast. Uh, <coughs> something uh, kind of exciting. Uh, I, they split up the two, the wingman and myself, to different targets. And I was, we'd finished one target. I was out looking for another, and I looked up, and there were three MiGs, uh, uh, Russian <coughs> MiG 15s, coming around. And they were close formation, so I knew two guys weren't looking at anything but the lead. And uh, belly up, and so I, I got quite excited. I was down at lower level, and they turned on around. They were within a mile of me, and uh, but they didn't see me, and they didn't engage me, and I didn't engage them. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether, what you call it cowardice or discretion, but uh, I often think back on it. It was very exciting, and, and when you think of the excitement, that some guys must have had, uh, well, whether they were on bomber crews or, or in a fighter plane and one-on-one -on -one engaging a bunch of, it must have been, got a lot of adrenaline going, because I got adrenaline going just seeing those MiGs. <laughs> but uh, it's the only ones I saw, and uh, they, like I say, they didn't see me, <clears throat> so I got the hell out of their neighborhood, you know. <laughs> I often wonder, I, I don't know whether they could have shot me down or not. Depended, would have depended on their experience, I'm sure. Uh, I figure I could have outturned any one of them, or any two of them, maybe. But while I was doing that, number three might have got a punch on me. I don't even ever thought about that possibility. I, I, I often wonder, but I'm glad I didn't it was find out. I probably got shot down. But, uh, we could uh, turn a MiG any day, and there were, uh, MiG was faster, and they had to slow down <coughs> any jet. Well, they could get on a propeller fighter, and then there's slow down, they sometimes override, and there were instances where various airplanes, the uh, Navy, Mustang, AVs, shot down MiGs, uh, because they were were going past them. They got on their tail and blasted them before they could get out of range again. So that's another story. Uh, uh, getting down close to the hour, uh, I had an additional assignment as the assistant maintenance officer. Our maintenance officer was not rated, so, and I had some engineering experience. So, so uh, I got to fly all the test hops so that I wanted. <coughs> that was practically all of them. But uh, I, uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, I, I was kind of a low-time pilot. I didn't have as much Mustang time as a lot of others. When I went to three, I had maybe 60 hours. And uh, so I was gung-ho. I, I wanted to fly anyway and build up time. <coughs> so after an uh, engineering test talk was done, I could joyride around Korea. So I learned quite a bit about it. Korea. I never went above the bomb line unless I had to as a mission. But South Korea on a, on a test lab, I, I saw a lot of the country. It became pretty familiar with it. <coughs> we had a piggyback Mustang. We called the pig. <coughs> That's a Mustang with this radio equipment removed and another type radio put in and the armament, uh, the armor plate taken off behind the seat, and a little seat in there so uh, you could take a passenger. <coughs> and uh, I saw to it that uh, all of our crew chiefs that wanted a ride had a, a ride in that piggy bag. And I'll tell you, there were a bunch of happy crew chiefs. Uh, they were really thrilled to get out and profile and buzz and see the Korean landscape and the poor folks that were living 
and down along the rivers and all that stuff. Clerk up to you and go by. What a good buzzing. I don't know how legal it was, but yeah. <laughs> we didn't worry too much about legal. Uh, we were lucky. Uh, I flew my 100th mission <coughs> December 28, 1951. And uh, then I got a rest uh, R&R what we call R&R &R in Japan. It was called rest and recuperation. And we didn't get much rest. Uh, actually, we got, a, uh, we got an R&R &R about every 30 to 35 missions to Japan, Tokyo, and various places. Uh, it was pretty neat for resting, uh, uh, shopping, sightseeing, good food. Uh, Lobster, filet mignon, and all, all the stuff that kind of went with it, you know. Uh, in even had uh, quite a few frog legs while I was over there. Pretty much a delicacy. But uh, <coughs> all the trip coming back was better than the trip going over. I went over on a troop ship <coughs> called the Aiken Victory, and I was two weeks out on the ocean, going into Yokosuka, Japan, but never saw land. Uh, we went above the bay circle up above Hawaii. <coughs> it was uh, it was not too swift. The salt water showers and all that, and a lot of troops and all, but uh, a lot of sick troops. But I was lucky I didn't do my earthy thing. But there was uh, being on a deal uh, in those chronic conditions. It, it wasn't a pleasant trip, but I lucked out. I got to fly back in a C-54. <coughs> from uh, Tachikawa to Hawaii and, and then on home. <coughs> that was another great day in my life, was getting back stateside. Now there's uh, pictures uh, that I've mentioned, the uh, targets, uh, these ones, artillery and supply area, three strike, full strike here. And, and uh, there's a few snapshots that might interest you here. These are oblique pictures of these are practice pictures. <clears throat> they sent us out, gave us targets to practice on in South Korea. Uh, I just happen to have these are quite nice of a pontoon bridge with some trucks getting ready to go over it in an airfield that they just want to. Uh, types of pictures we could take down on the deck uh, at uh, an oblique position. This is uh, <coughs> finishing my 100 missions congratulated by uh, Colonel Hudson, who was a West Pointer, one of the few regulars. <coughs> but he was a West Pointer and a real great guy. I took him on his first mission, too. So I uh, was about my 60th when he came in as CO. There's uh, pictures of Korea, <coughs> Tegu, Tegu Town, pack, uh, A frames at the uh, laborers and people wore. Well, not just laborers. They hauled a lot of stuff on pack crate. Uh, a gentleman farmer with his long robe and black hat, retired farmer. And the way they lived down on the river, uh, how they existed, I'll never know. The refugees uh, would live in lean tins, lean tubes, and <coughs> they'd wash their clothes and bathe and drink the water, I guess. Some of the water wasn't too <coughs> too good, but, uh, as you might guess. These are pretty well self-explanatory. I'm heading for the shower here, and I'm washing clothes here. Runway du uh, control duty, and this is uh, <coughs> where we were breaking camp in uh, in uh, Tegu. So, <coughs> questions? Could you describe a typical mission day from the time they woke you up to interrogation and so on? Could you take us through a average day's mission? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <coughs> to begin with, the lucky days were when we got a mission, but uh, sometimes they were even luckier. We got two or three. The third one usually was a special or an emergency mission. You know, they called us out. After the but to begin a day, we all were rousted out for breakfast, and we all went to briefing. Uh, I guess you'd call it a group briefing, where they they appraised 
list of uh, things that went on the, the previous day, where there had been juicy targets, and in some instances tanks, and, and uh, various attacks, uh, where there might have been someone shot down that, that wasn't uh, uh, brought out. That we, if we're in the area, we might sniff around, you know, see if we could see anything. And uh, weather, weather briefing, and anything else they wanted to tell us. <coughs> of course, they had the uh, weather was vi very vital, much a factor, especially the Mustang. Sometimes they'd send a, you'd hear a recce bird go in the morning when it's marginal just to see if we could, could operate in the, in the target area. But, uh, <coughs> anyway, we were briefed. And then we had our various extra assignments to go to or started flying missions and scheduled missions during the day. Uh, gosh, I don't remember even how many missions. We must have had uh, probably 20 stories a week uh, that day. <coughs> probably don't have about any kind of fire. Most of the time, uh, we talked about weather. We never had good weather to take off. It was always foggy in Korea. Uh, you're lucky to see it, you know, 150, 200 feet away, but it wasn't deep, usually, unless it was a real weather pattern. But we'd take off all this crap. We wonder if we'd be able to find the, the field when we got back, but uh, it would usually burn off. By the time we came back, the sun had come up and start burning it off, so we could, we had pretty good visibility. So I often wondered. Where were you given your, your individual mission? Oh, that was scheduled by the operations officer the day prior. <clears throat> so we knew by checking the, uh, the deal of squadron operations, who was leading the flight, uh, who was the wingman, what core area we were going to, and when we'd go into the core, we would to a certain uh, uh, controller and authenticate. But we were scheduled the day before, and uh, uh, everything but airplane numbers. Sometimes they didn't, they could assign a few airplanes, but they didn't know which airplanes were going to fly the next day. We, we knew that when we reported it in operation. You should always confer with your crew chief when you go out to your airplane. Oh. Your airplane. That was the pilot's to see if these airplanes had everything that he had run up the day before or something like that. So you bet. Uh, That's the first thing you do with your crew chase. Crew chase, uh, all the four fuckers up there, we are working all night on airplanes sometime. In the early morning hours, they were running them up, and uh, you could hear them out there checking them out, you know, so we could fly them uh, winter, summer, and all that. But, uh, no, hell, I had to fly my airplane without making a walk around. My crew chief was so conscientious, I hated to tell him anything was wrong with it. But he'd worry about it. When you came back from the mission, did you go through a debriefing procedure of some sort? Yeah. We would report, report to our intelligence officer, uh, in a, one of our quonsets, and uh, we'd tell him what we saw, what we were assigned, if we were taking photos, what area, and uh, we had, we jotted down, we have all, all the clipboards, you know, for writing down for what coordinates uh, we saw, whatever, and uh, what coordinates uh, we took pictures, and if it was a fighter strike, uh, uh, we were working with Navy Marines or our fighter bombers or rocks or whatever. Uh, report to them our appraisal or, or what we estimated that the, the damage, whether we've done a good job or whatever. I have another question. Did you talk to some of the pilots who flew the F-86 jets and and did they, how did they compare our jets with the MiGs? How, were they confident in the air? Very. Uh, <coughs> they were the elite. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the, the Sabre Jet, that's another story. 
Is that the most modern one, the F-86? Yeah, that's the most modern they had, and uh, they got them a little later. Uh, the F-84 and the F-80 and the British Meteor, they, they were no match for MiG. Uh, they got the crap kicked out of them. Like but that. the F-86 was better? Oh, yeah. It, it had its pluses and its minuses. I mean, uh, it was heavier. Uh, maybe not quite as maneuverable in a tight turn because the thing was lighter and, and all this jazz. But the speed and the dive and the armament, the protection, and more sophistication. And it was a much better airplane. As was proven, and I don't know about the training. I guess that I would say our training was probably better. Although uh, they had some highly trained pilots flying MiGs. Uh, I, I've seen stats on the, the ratio that it was somewhere uh, maybe 1 to 15. We maybe lost 1 to about 15 or so. Do you remember, Larry? The, the I can't stats? remember the exact numbers. Somewhere in that neighborhood for 1 to 10. I, I think it's better than 1 to 10. Pardon? With the Chinese, with the Chinese they shot a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, when the Polish mercenary pilot Depend on whether Chinese or yeah. North Koreans or Russians. Right. I mean, some of the Russians were pretty good. They didn't talk a lot about it, but I'm, I think some of those airplanes were going back over the yellow. We couldn't go over the yellow legally. Mm. We happen to know that <coughs> there's a few exceptions. <coughs> but uh, in fact, Larry, I'm on overtime. But uh, one thing that we did have a <coughs> in our squadron a, an air guard ace that flew shot down five minutes in an F-86. Uh, Cliff Jolly, I don't know if you've ever heard of Cliff Jolly, but he was going over and I saw him at Apache Cowell when I had, was coming back. Little did I know he'd end up an ace or flying 86s. I didn't even know he had some previous jet time. F-80s, <coughs> F-33s, but he had a buddy that got him in over there, and Cliff was a real excellent pilot, and uh, Mustangs or anything that flew, but uh, he was the only Air Guard ace in Korea. Did that answer whatever yeah. that question? I would oh! Just, I just had one other one about MacArthur. What, did you agree with his firing, or? <laughs> or did you think he should have gone into China? Oh, we could open up a big bucket of work. Personally, I figured Harry was the boss, and uh, you know, if he wasn't doing what Harry wanted, he got it what he deserved. He got his butt kicked out. But uh, with MacArthur, there's a lot of controversy out whether he was great or not great. To me, he was a great general, and he was doing a job, and I'm, we might have been better off if he let him go and kick the crap out of him. Well, we lost, a lot, we lost a lot of men over there after negotiations started. Oh, well, <coughs> he had them, you know, he could have uh, beat the crap out of you know, if Harry had let him, or we let him go. That's what a general's for, is to win the war. But, uh, whether it was right politically or not politically, I don't know. I think, in a lot of ways, it was right because we still got a North Korea and South Korea. They're trying to get together. We still got commies and, and free enterprise. And, and we'd taken the whole damn thing. It might have been a, another thing. You know, we, we wouldn't have had this situation. But whether that's right or wrong, I can. That's my opinion. Uh, we were there to fight a war and win a war, and there were times that, oh, uh, this is another story. We were limited uh, even on targets we could get. Yeah. Bridges and power stations, some of that stuff. They said, oh, don't get that, because we might be occupying that in a month. Uh, so we, we don't want to rebuild it. It's kind of, you know, like all wars, it was stupid. The other, uh, I appreciate your attention and you're welcome to the
have to ask you all to please sign our guest book out here. Yeah. Well, we like him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, for you. Uh, 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 uh,